Again, in collectivist societies, identity normally derives from the group in which one is embedded. One is of Nazareth, or of Cyrene, identifying the place or community in which identity resides. At a, mere, at a more specific level, one is son of Joseph, or son of Abraham. See how that's collectivistic? You'll see that? If you're the son of Joseph and Joseph was a lowlife, what do you have to be? A lowlife. Low Joseph was what? A, 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 a village artisan, one of the ergotai, a day laborer. So what must Jesus be? A day laborer also. If Jesus is not a day laborer, he's a folk healer, and lo, oh, wait a minute, he's not just a folk healer, he's the Messiah and cosmic Lord. That's strange, isn't it? His birth status doesn't give him that. It had to come from somewhere else. If at all, unless either that or Jesus is being very dishonorable by behaving outside of his social status. Yes, Joe? There's more than one Joseph, more than one Abraham, so how would you really know? No, the Abraham and the Joseph, that's why, first of all, you need to say, of Nazareth. Yeah, geography. Joe, no, 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 geography. Geography tells us what Joseph we're talking about. The Joseph everywhere? No, 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 Joe. No, no, Joe. The Joseph that's there, the son of Joseph. And if you need to be more specific, they have ways of getting more specific. They got three Josephs there. How do you know which one? Yeah, no, they do know, Joe. They have ways because they're not Americans. Mm -hmm. One Joseph is like every Joseph in Nazareth. Once you say he's of Nazareth, I know what's in Nazareth. Low lives. Anything expected good to come out of Nazareth? No, Joe, you're thinking like an American. Mm -hmm. Americans think like that. Like, every individual person is a universe. So you can name them 58 Josephs. There are 58 different universes we're talking about. That's not how this world is. If you're from Nazareth, all the same. Everybody there is the same. Everybody's the same. If you're from Crete, right, you're a liar. All Cretans are liars. See how stereotyping is very prevalent in this world. Get what I'm saying? So it doesn't matter who your father is, it matters where you're from. It matters where you're from and also your father. Of course it matters who your father is. No, 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 Joe, you're, you're an American. It's hard. I know it's hard. It's hard to be an American looking at this. Very hard. And Americans, see, Americans, all people everywhere, it doesn't matter if you're American or not, like to insist when you read something or listen to somebody that they think and act just like you. But Americans have nuclear weapons and a lot of money. And when you have a lot of money and a lot of weapons, your own particular brand of ethnic, ethnocentrism becomes obnoxious. Obnoxious. Woo! Stinks real bad. Stink up the place. Because you've got power and privilege. Woo! Up the wazoo. And, and you just expect everybody to think and perceive things just like you. It's hard. It's very hard. you got to listen. you got to come down. Most of the world has no problem with these things. They got it because they're collectivistic. They perceive reality in a completely different way. Yes, uh, Danny. This is the world that the Old Testament came from. And in the Old Testament, that's why some of us fall asleep during the high holy days when we have to say, son of this one, son of that one, son of right. this one, son of... That's an honor rating. Right. And it's the same thing also in Catholic, in Mass. If we ever, or if we're reading the Bible, Jesus was the son of the... Why do I have to hear how Jesus was the son of David, the son of Abraham, and all these things? Of course you have to hear that. That's establishing how this artisan could possibly be justifiably linked with being the Messiah and the Cosmic Lord. He has to be given an honorable childhood, which, by the way, was invented after the resurrection. And the church does not insist. You have to take all the details in the Bible and the Gospels as 21st century biographical facts. The Bible's all true, and some of it actually happened. Yes, Rose? We still have collective societies today. Like oh, 80% of the world's cultures today, possibly 80, borderline 90, are collectivist societies. But what happened? They don't have the nuclear weapons, though. I know. And what happened? <laughs> They're not in charge, and they don't matter. For instance, someone in the family doesn't want to be in the collective. They kicked out, right? And they, when they get kicked out, like for instance, they like when they become refugees, they die. They wash up on the beach. And nobody cares. Or maybe I care. I, if I could get off my selfishness and my isolated individualism. 
Maybe, maybe I could start to care and be a little vulnerable. Let's continue. Let's go back because we got to we got to keep on working here. Let's work on. All right. So at a more specific level, son of Joseph, son of Abraham. But one is first geography of Nazareth of Cyrene. All right. First, you find his name, Jesus. That's male, male name, Yeshua. That's male. All right. That's important because that tells us he's not female. Of Nazareth, right? Son of Joseph. That tells me all I need to know about him. No way could he be the Messiah, unless God somehow intervened in some way. Thus, identity is family identity. When persons did not behave in accord with the expectations of the group into which they were embedded, confusion reigned. Here, the dunker's behavior is rather unusual. Symbolic river dipping is a prophetic act in Israel. Such behavior would be out of keeping with John's birth status, or anybody else's for that matter. I mean, prophets are always called, right? It's a special function. It's outside of anyone's birth status. Thereby, it ha for a prophet to appear on the scene, it always raises questions about his identity. Who are you? The inquirers, Judeans from Jerusalem, have the first word in the story of John, in the Johannine jo narrative. They're the first people to talk. Their concern is whether some special status other than birth status is implied in John's behavior. Like, where did you get this authority from? And what exactly are you doing? Who are you? That's not an individualist question. That's a collectivistic question. John chapter 1, verses 20 to 22. He confessed and did not deny, but confessed. I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, Uk Amy, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Remember, self in the Mediterranean world of the Bible is always group self. Yourself is the group to which you belong to. If you are going to die to yourself, you have to die to one group and raise into another group. You don't have a group. You don't have existence, folks. The Dunker vigorously denies all of this. Hook Amy am not. His emphatic denials are remote preparation for the Johannine Jesus, who alone can claim ego Amy. I am. See how John the Dunker in John in, in, in the fourth gospel, John the Dunker is identified as being Hook Amy am not. That's very cool, isn't it? But Jesus, again and again, in the fourth gospel, is ego Amy. I am. But an answer has to be had for those Judeans in Jerusalem. They won't, they won't give him a break. they got to have an answer. John 1, Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? So the dunker explains his mission in terms taken from Deutero Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40 through 55. Isaiah 43, 40 verse 3. A voice cries out, In the desert prepare the way of Yahweh. Make straight in the wasteland a highway for our God. John chapter 1 verses 24 to 28. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you dunking, if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I dunk with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was dunking. What could be, because the Greek is ambiguous, 
a second delegation, now asks a question that clearly associates behavior and status, links them. Why do you baptizes? You, why do you dunk if you are neither the Messiah, Elijah, nor the prophet? John in, justifies his an, actions not in terms of his own birth status, but as a prelude to the coming of one greater, more honorable than he. Though John's actions had suggested to onlookers a higher status than his own birth status, John the Dunker himself offers a different assessment. He suggests that his interlocutors have misread the situation rather sharply. All four canonical Gospels downplay the role of John the Dunker in the life of Jesus. Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. All present John the Dunker as Jesus' inferior, but they don't do this the same way. As we see the evolution of the written Gospels taking place in the first century, the later the Gospel, the smaller and more insignificant the role John the Dunker is given. Why is this? Think about it this way. At some point in time, the late 20s common era, in Syro-Palestine, we have the context of the pre-Paschal Jesus himself. The pre-Paschal, that's Jesus before his death and resurrection. Pre-Paschal. He's alive, a peasant Galilean folk healer. Walking around, talking in Galilean villages, people are listening to him. In a certain context, 2,000 years ago, in a culture radically different than ours. After Jesus' death and resurrection, there is a period of time where other people talk about Jesus, talking about stuff, doing stuff, and meeting other historical personages and interacting with them, like John the Dunker. Every one of those people that is either recounting memories or hearsay is doing it in a new and different context. As this spreads geographically throughout a region, this diversifies. Culture, context multiply left and right. And the result of this is, the meaning of the spoken words of Jesus are changing. And the meaning of the doings and actions and healings of Jesus are changing. And the meaning of his interactions with other historical personages, like John the Dunker, are changing. Again, according to church teaching, the Gospels, our primary source for learning about Jesus, can only be interpreted and understood developmentally. The Gospels themselves emerged through an evolution, a three-stage process. Stage one, the original words and deeds of the historical Jesus. Stage two, the oral proclamation of the apostles in light and disciples in light of the resurrection. They, they witnessed and experienced the risen Lord and they proclaimed Him Lord of the cosmos and Messiah. That necessarily changed how they saw stage one. Right? If, if somebody is talking to you stories and healing you, you might think he's sent from God as a great human being, as a saint, but you wouldn't necessarily think he is cosmic Lord and Messiah, correct? Yes, class? Yeah. You wouldn't, right? Okay. But if suddenly he appeared to you risen in glory and conveyed to you something that would make you think, wow, this is the cosmic Lord and Messiah soon to inaugurate theocracy, then everything you saw him do or heard about him do and say in his earthly life 
you would have to reinterpret and reevaluate, wouldn't you? Yes or no? Yes. yes. You would have to reevaluate the whole shebang. Because you didn't know who it was that was doing it. Now you got who he was. Now everything takes on a cosmic significance now, right? There you go. And finally, the church says there's a third stage. The church is borrowing this from scholarship, biblical scholarship. Stage three, after the deaths of the apostles, communities sat down and wrote down the gospels themselves, and they were going through different situations than the apostles in stage two, and Jesus and his followers in the Jesus movement, stage one. So context again changes. The church says the most important stage is stage three. Okay, so let's see how that, that looks. We'll date the Gospels. And here is a model of the first century. From the year 30 CE to the year 100 CE. Around the year 30 CE, Jesus is, is, is executed. He's crucified. And quickly, right after, proclaimed risen. The earliest literature we have as church comes from Paul, 1 Thessalonians. His seven authentic letters are all written sometime in the 50s, common era. James, Peter, and Paul are all martyred in the mid-60s. Jerusalem is destroyed around the year 70 CE. The first gospel to be written, the first narrative gospel to be written, is Mark. Probably by, the, by a Jesus group in Rome. Notice how many years between Mark and the death of Jesus. Forty years. Mark is not an eyewitness to Jesus. Consider the lifespans of people living back then. I was just noticing that James, Peter, and Paul must have been pretty old for their time when they were martyred. Exactly. They were and they were probably very young when they were with Jesus. Very young. Like 13? Could have been in their, in their teens, late teens. I wouldn't say maybe not 13, but they have to be over 12. And maybe under 20, even married. Two other communities have a copy of Mark, but they improve it with sayings and theologies slightly different from Mark. A lot of different sayings that are not found in Mark. But they owe their narrative structure to Mark. So they make Mark 2.0, which is Matthew and Luke. Notice that arrows come from Mark to Matthew and Mark to Luke, but there are no arrows between Luke and Matthew. That's because Luke never read Matthew, and Matthew never read Luke. How do we know that? Matthew. I, I've gone into that multiple times, Joe. It's a great question. I'll refer to you back to the, the whole... Matthew couldn't have read Luke, because yeah. Luke was re written later. Than the infancy narratives, we know that, Joe, through scholarship that I've mentioned before. I've got, that, was, that was a whole class, so let's try to, try to say that uh, sharply and quickly. Uh, the infancy narratives are extremely different. Extremely different between Matthew and Luke. Uh, the rearrangement of sayings of Jesus and parables of Jesus are done in a way that they could not have been copying from each other. And yet, it's undeniable that Matthew and Luke both have sayings that are common to Matthew and Luke, but not found in Mark. If Matthew never read Luke, and we know that, and Luke never read Matthew, and we know that, where did they get their common sayings from that are not found in Mark? Scholars say that there must have been an earlier source of a, a, a gospel that was not a narrative gospel. It didn't have a story. It just had a collection of sayings. And that's called, by German scholars, Q, from the German word for source. The gospel we call John is the gospel from outer space. It's very alien to the synoptic tradition. Synoptic because if you look at Mark, Matthew, and Luke with the same eye, synopsis, it presents basically the same story. John is radically different in theology and narrative and many things. Its evolution is very different. Not owing to Mark, Matthew, Luke, or Q. Its purpose is even different. Right. So understanding the evolution of these documents, stage one, stage two, and stage three. 
The Gospels evolved, folks. They evolved. I want you to see that in the timeline. So getting back to John, by way of Mark, in stage one of the evolution of the written Gospels, Jesus, before his own ministry, before his own Jesus movement, hold on to your seats, was most likely had been a disciple of John the Dunker. He had been his follower and co-worker. Experiencing growing success as a folk healer and exorcist convinced Jesus, the pre paschal Jesus, to work out his own Jesus movement apart from the Dunkers. Not a dunking movement, but a Jesus movement. The golden opportunity for this came when the Dunker was arrested and killed. That's stage one, probably. Jesus never would have been dishonorable to his master by going off and making a movement before his master died. That would have been dishonorable, right? That opportunity was provided when John the Dunker was arrested and executed by Herod Antipas. Writing decades after, in the light of the resurrection, the Gospel writers are embarrassed about Jesus' previous submitting to his master, John the Dunker. Why would the Messiah and Cosmic Lord need to submit to anybody? So John the Dunker becomes an interesting problem. You can't knock him, because he was a holy man. Everybody knew that. But at the same time, his inferiority to Jesus has to be expressed. Theologically, even though it wasn't clear historically. Jesus couldn't leave Nazareth and not join him. If he left Nazareth, shamefully he leaves his village. He had to join John the Dunker and his, his uh, faction. When John the Dunker's faction, when John the Dunker dies and his faction splits up, Jesus sees that as God telling him, look, it's time to form your own faction, the Jesus movement. So what do the gospel writers do 40 to 70 years after? They summarize and simplify things. This is true even with the earliest written Gospel, Mark. But for John, the contrast between Jesus and John the Dunker is even more profound. John chapter 1, verse 27. John said, John the Dunker said, I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. Folks, in the ancient world, when you walk in the streets, there's a little stream in the street in the middle where the dogs eat and homeless people that are about to die eat and get their food from. In that place is animal and human waste. When you walk in the streets in the Mediterranean world of the first century, in the villages of Galilee and in Jerusalem, it is filled with human filth. And when you arrive at somebody's house to eat dinner, your feet stink and they are covered with filth. It would not be right if you are going to someone's house for the master of the house who is your social equal, because in the Mediterranean world, you only eat with social equals, for that social equal to wash your feet. Right? It would not be right even for the children of that social equal to do that, or his students, his, if he was a, ma a teacher, for his pupils to, to wash the, the master's feet is something, even that is not proper. No, you own people. And the people you own, slaves, those are the people who have no honor, that are right and fit to do the washing of the feet. So look what John the Dunker says and understand what he means here. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. Is that John the Dunker saying, I have a, a, a great honor status? Oh, no, 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 no. Very low. Since untying sandals for another person was an action proper to a slave. Again, behavior and status go together, right? In the Mediterranean collectivist way of thinking. 
since untying of sandals was considered beneath even that status of a pupil of a teacher. The implication is that John's status is low indeed. John the Dunker's status in the gospel we call John is extremely low. Beneath that of a slave compared to Jesus. We've come a long way since 30 CE, haven't we? A long way. Originally, stage one, John the Dunker was probably Jesus' master until he died. Now he's become less than a slave. Interesting. Note that this is the third of five occasions in which the author asserts that John the Dunker is beneath Jesus on the scale of honor. Let's take a short break. 